Good morning. And welcome to Archdale United Methodist Church. It is wonderful to see all of your smiling faces this morning. Let's begin our worship in song as we sing Christ for the World. I remember. Now welcome one another.
wonderful invitation for us to hear as we sing God's praise today. I want to welcome everyone to worship. So good to see everybody here today. I've met some, some new folks today. We want to give you a, a special welcome this morning. Um, we'd like to ask everyone if you'd please take a moment and find your attendance pads. If you'll please sign in your name, address, your phone number. We'd be so grateful to have that from you. I uh, do want to ask you, after worship, take a good thorough reading of the bulletin, all the events that are upcoming. do want to highlight just a few things. Uh, the next senior lunch is this Wednesday at 1130. Uh, also, we still have some volunteer needs uh, on a once-a-month basis, more if possible. But uh, for preschool, Sunday school teachers, we really want to get that class going. We need some volunteers to step forward. Also, for children's church, taking one Sunday out of the month to uh, lead children's church. Please be in prayer about that and be willing to serve. I uh, also want to let you know the uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up in the middle of July. Our first volunteer meeting is Saturday morning, May the 31st. See the bulletin for, for more information about that. So just wanted to highlight those few things. Again, take a look at everything uh, following worship today. Well, at this time, I want to call upon Peggy Johnson, who heads up our Stevens ministry, to come forward at this time. She has some things to share, and we... Look forward to this day. Yeah, you want to? Okay. And to share about Stephen Ministry as uh, we celebrate Stephen Ministry in the month of May. Good morning. Stephen Ministry is a ministry that we have here at Archdale in our congregation, which trained and supervised lay persons like all the rest of us are, are and they're called Stephen Ministers. But they provide one-on-one -on -one Christian care to individuals who are facing challenges or difficulties in their life. The name Stephen comes from St. Stephen in the Bible. In Acts chapter 6, it tells us that the apostles asked Stephen or appointed Stephen to be in charge of those persons in need. Stephen ministers are caring Christian friends who listen, understand, accept and pray for and with care receivers who are working through a crisis or difficult time in their life. Stephen Ministry was founded in 1975 in St. Louis and we have had Stephen Ministry here at Archdale since 1997. And in those 17 years of having Stephen Ministry here, the Stephen Ministers has given caring Christian caring to approximately 91 people in our congregation and some in other congregations also. It's not just Archdale. But if you take that 91 and you multiply it by an hour, because meetings are at least an hour a week, ideally, but some of those meetings go on for weeks, months, and years in some cases. So you can see how our congregation cares for others. We are one of more than 8,500 congregations with Stephen Ministry, and they come from over 90 denominations, so it's interdenominational for sure. People on the receiving end or the caring end all grow through Stephen Ministry. The person receiving care grows as he or she experiences God's love in a tangible way during this time of great need. The Stephen minister grows as he or she encounters God at work through the caring relationship, bringing hope and healing into the care receiver's life. Our current Stephen ministers by name and ask them to come and stand before the congregation at this time, along with Peggy Johnson, our leader, uh, Rosa Allred, uh, Ed Wren, Diane Cantlett, Lunda Stanley, Lori Hamilton, Carol Hankins, Gail Rearwin, and Mike Cheswick. Let's give a special thank you to all the ways they serve. And before I offer a prayer of 
recommissioning, if you will, for each one of them. I do want to say to each one of them before you, as I, I think about their special ministry, I think of a verse in the Bible. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the first part of the verse, it speaks of Jesus as our high priest, and it says this. It says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. It's a reminder to us that Jesus has gone through all of life that we know and all that we go through, so he understands whatever we're facing. But it's also a blessing when God brings along special people who have gone through similar situations, times of challenge, trial, grief, and who can walk with us through those times. And that's what I see so much and appreciate so much about Stephen Ministry. And uh, they are here to serve in any way as you face different challenges in life. So uh, let's have a special prayer for them and the whole ministry together. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for Stephen Ministry and its special calling to come and walk beside people through some of the most challenging, trying moments of life. Thank you for each one that you have called to this ministry. And we ask you, Lord, to just fill them with your Holy Spirit. Use them in such special ways to touch and encourage others. Thank you for how they are a picture of what your love is all about. And we just thank you as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much to our Stephen Ministry. Well, it is time now for our children's moments, and leading that today, it's not going to be Jill, as mentioned in the bulletin, but Rebecca Garcia. So, Rebecca, if you'll come, if the kids will come and join her, and then they're excused for Children's Church. sad. Good morning. That was a little better. <laughs> so, what do you guys know that changes over time? Does anybody know anything? No? A flower? That's a butterfly. Did you look? <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, one of the things that I think about is a butterfly. So a butterfly starts out as a little caterpillar, right? And then it goes into a cocoon, right? And then hymos, right? And it stays in that cocoon until it develops into a butterfly, right? They're really pretty, aren't they? So the Bible tells us in Romans 12, too, that we shouldn't let the world change who we are, but instead we should let Jesus change who we are. And so when we do that, we can come, become more beautiful than a butterfly, right? And when we let Jesus do that, then we can become beautiful and help make the world become more beautiful, right? So we're going to say a prayer. God, thank you for this day, and thank you for the, um, being able to come here together. And God, please help us to allow you to change us so we may become more beautiful and help make the world become more beautiful. Amen. It's a shame they don't have any energy in it. <laughs> As we go to God now in prayer, let us prepare ourselves by joining in our call to prayer and our response to prayer, hymn number 430, verses 1 and 2.
Let us pray. Oh God, we come before you this morning thanking you for this day and for this opportunity that we might come and worship and praise your holy name. We pray that you will be with us now and open our hearts and fill us with your spirit. Help us to hear what you want us to hear, but more especially help us to live what you want us to be. Help us to go from this place and live with you each moment of our lives. Guide us in all that we do, we pray. Our Father, we pray that you will be with those who are not here. Be with them if they're sick or they're traveling. Be near them. And our Father, we pray that you will enter their being and fill them with your spirit and your peace. Heal them in the way that you know they need to be healed. Our Father, we pray now that you will be with us and and help us to hear your word. We pray that you will be with Stuart as he brings your message to us. And our Father, help this time not be just an act or a, a, a time when we can go through the motions. But we pray that you will fill us and help us to worship you from the depths of our heart. Help us to be sincere and give us what we need to do that. Our Father, we pray now that you will, as always, be near us. And help us always to remember the life of Jesus. And help us always to remember how he taught us to pray for all of our needs. In saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, now we return to you just a portion of the bountiful blessings that you have given to us. We pray that you will use them in bringing your kingdom here on earth. For we ask this in thy son's name. Amen.
That was I Will Rise. Let's say thank you again to the choir. Beautiful, beautiful song. And a great message in that. Just appreciate that so much. It just uh, fits so well with all that we're looking at. And as we say thank you, uh, I want to also say thank you to Rebecca Garcia. That was her first ever children's message. And since it was her first, I gave her plenty of time to prepare. Uh, I talked to her last night at 7 p.m. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing that with our, our young people today. I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Acts. We're going to look at uh, the first chapter, the first eight verses. And uh, Acts chapter 1, the first eight verses as we continue to look at this whole idea that because Jesus is alive. And uh, today it's uh, because Jesus is alive, I can change the world. So uh, let's see and get a little inspiration about that today. In Acts, the first chapter, uh, this is Luke writing. He is the one that God inspired to write the Gospel of Luke, and he follows it up with the, the book of Acts, giving us a beautiful history of the early days of the church and uh, a great outline for how we should serve even today. So let's see what happens. Acts, the first chapter, beginning with verse 1. It says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. 
For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. But you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. One of my favorite magazines to read is Our State Magazine. How many of you have ever looked at Our State Magazine? And, and one of the reasons it's so easy for me to read is that the articles are extremely short because the magazine is made up mostly of beautiful photographs, pictures taken from all across the state of North Carolina. Well, about five years ago, Emily and I were looking at an edition of our state magazine as we flipped through the pages we came to this beautiful picture of the Cape Hatteras lighthouse we looked at that and Emily looked up to me and said daddy could you take me so that I could go up in the top of that lighthouse I would love to to go up in the top of that and I thought for a minute and I said yeah we could but then, then I got to thinking Luann and I had been in the top of that lighthouse in September of 2003 it was about eight or nine weeks before Emily was born. So I said, Emily, the truth is you have been to the top of that lighthouse. <laughs> and when you were at the top of the lighthouse, you were in mommy's tummy. She looked up at me and said, I was in mommy's tummy? I said, yes. And she paused a moment and thought, and she said, Daddy, why did mommy eat me? <laughs> now, how do you answer a question like that? very carefully right well we love to ask questions in life don't we and even as Christians even as followers of Jesus we love to ask questions too we we ask those questions like why do bad things happen to good people we wonder about events in the Bible wondering where was Jesus between the ages of 12 and 30 and everybody says he was with the Native Americans I don't know but it one answer you get from it but here's another question we think of, a, a more practical question. And that is, how is it that God can use common, ordinary, believing people like you and me to make a difference and to change this world? Well, the world was on Jesus' mind as he gathers with his disciples for that very last time. It was a day much like today. It had been about five or six weeks since he had risen again from the dead. And in that 40-day period, he has showed himself to many people. So the word is spreading like wildfire that Jesus really has risen again from the dead. But he gathers together with his 11 remaining disciples. They have a meal together. And after they eat, he has some instructions for them. He says to them, he says, I don't want you to leave Jerusalem. I want you to stay here for all that our Heavenly Father has promised you. And, and Jesus reminds him of how John baptized with water. And, and he says, but very soon you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, the disciples still have some questions to ask Jesus. And so one of them speaks up. I don't know which one, but, but this disciple speaks up and says, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Even though Jesus has risen from the dead, they're still wondering if Jesus will throw off the shackles of the Roman government so the people of Israel can be free. But Jesus lets them know real quick, his ultimate work is not about that kind of human revolution. He says to his disciples, he says, it's not for you to know the times and the dates that have been set by your heavenly father. And then he gives them their marching orders. He lets them know their mission, their purpose in the world. That is when Jesus says to him, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's a whole lot in that one verse of Scripture 
Because it speaks of the power of the Holy Spirit. A reminder to us that we can do nothing for God unless it is His power at work in our hearts and in our lives. But right in the middle of that verse, he says something. He says, we will be His witnesses. His witnesses. And that word witnesses and that word witness really stands out in that verse. What do you think about when you hear the word witness? You think to yourself and you think that is somebody who, who speaks up and tells the truth. Somebody who tells of what happened. Many times when we hear the word witness, we think of a courtroom, don't we? Somebody in a legal setting who is to testify as to exactly what happened or exactly was said. And as Christians, we are to be a witness like that for the Lord. That through our actions and our deeds and our words, that we would communicate to the whole world who Jesus is, how much he loves everybody. But you know this word witness for Christians, it goes even deeper than that. Most of the time I, I speak in English and rarely do I go back to the Greek that the, the New Testament was originally written in, but, but I've got to today. Because you know this word witness, you know how it is given in the original Greek? It's the word martus. Now I know you don't use the word martus. But that word martus is also the root word for another word in our English language. It's the word martyr. Someone who is willing to to give up their life because of what they believe in. So you see, when Jesus is using this word witness, he is describing someone who so believes in Jesus and so wants to live for Jesus and so wants to share Jesus that they would willingly give up their life for him. That's what he means by this word witness. And as he uses the word witness, he then kind of lays out where we are to be a witness. Almost in a progressive manner, he says, uh, you are to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, into Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And what I want us to do this morning, I want us to look at what Jesus meant as he was speaking to those disciples about their Jerusalem, their Judea, their Samaria, their ends of the earth. But then I want us also to look at what it means for us today to be a witness in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, our ends of the earth, if you will. First of all, Jesus says to his disciples, they are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was founded 4,000 years ago. And by the year 1000 B.C., it had become the capital of the entire Jewish people. It's there that David became the king and he, he ruled over the nation in its most glorious days. And, and there David's son Solomon constructed the temple and the royal palace. And, and there Jesus performed many miracles and faced conflict and healed people. But now Jesus is saying to his followers, I want you to be my witnesses right here in Jerusalem. And within 10 days, they're doing that. Because as Jesus speaks these words, he does ascend to heaven. 10 days later, as promised, he sends the power of the Holy Spirit upon the believers on a very special day, the day called Pentecost. It's a day when people from all over converge upon that city. And there are people there from so many places and they speak so many languages. So when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon the believer, they are supernaturally equipped to share the message of Jesus in all the different languages of the people. It is that important that everybody would hear about Jesus in a way that they can understand. And they were all witnesses for Jesus that day. And 3,000 people come to believe in him. It doesn't stop there. The disciples continue to preach. The church begins to blossom and to grow. And, and they do find some challenging times. Because one day this brave man by the name of Stephen, the one that, that Peggy spoke about, who was so willing to serve, one day he lays down his life because of his faith and his convictions and his courageous stand for Jesus. That's how these believers live as witnesses in Jerusalem. What about our Jerusalem? 
And what's it mean for every one of us to be a witness in our Jerusalem too? Well, first of all, you've got to think about where is our Jerusalem? Well, kind of arbitrarily, let me just say, our Jerusalem would be like a two-mile radius from this church. That's a good way of looking at our Jerusalem, our immediate area, our immediate neighborhood. And how are we being a, a witness for Jesus right here in our neighborhood? As I say neighborhood, I can't help but think of Neighborhood Cafe. You know, last spring, God put that burden upon the hearts of people and the, the ministry and mission idea began to grow and blossom. And, and by this October, we launched the ministry, 60, 70 people being served a meal each night. But you know, for the past four Thursday nights, an average of over 200 meals have been served at Neighborhood Cafe. And not only is it a reason for us to praise God today, to rejoice in what he's done, it's also what that meal and that special time is giving a great opportunity to happen. This past Thursday, as I was there and somebody just came up to me, somebody who's not a member of this church, but somebody who comes to the meal and just said, Stuart, I need to tell you about something, and I, I want to ask you to pray about this. And so we prayed about it right there. And that's not the first time that's happened. It's a blessing to see on Sunday morning people who have gotten acquainted with this church through Neighborhood Cafe being in worship and at other churches in our community. See, that's being a witness for Jesus right in your own Jerusalem. It happens as people go down and serve and, and volunteer at Code. It happens as people volunteer with communities and schools and especially Archdale Elementary School. But how are you being a witness for Jesus? right in your own Jerusalem. Jesus tells his disciples, I, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Next, he says, in Judea. Now, Judea is the region in which Jerusalem was the capital. When God's people settled there, it had taken the name of Israel, but just like this country, they one day had a civil war. It split the nation in half, one nation to the north, another to the south. The nation to the north took the name Israel, the nation to the south, Judah or Judea. And that's the region where Jerusalem is located. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, you will be my witnesses, just not in Jerusalem, but throughout Judea. And again, at first, they are very effective doing that because they do share their faith, especially in the city of Jerusalem. But then something happens. As they share the message more and more, and as more and more people come to believe, and as the church grows in number and influence, so do its enemies. And the Jewish leaders get together with the Roman authorities, and they institute a horrible policy, a policy that is summed up in one word, the one word, persecution. By government authority, they begin to, to seek out the followers of Jesus. On many occasions, just for being a believer in Jesus, you lose your job. You lose your home. You're thrown into prison. You're tortured, as it was with Stephen and others, sometimes put to death, hoping to squelch out this brand new Jesus movement. But you know it has the opposite effect. Because wherever the believers are persecuted in and around Jerusalem, it causes them to scatter throughout all of Judea, and wherever they go, they take the message of Jesus with them. And they continue to be a witness there to tell people about Jesus. That's how they were witnesses right there in Judea. Now, what about our Judea? What's it mean for you and me to be a witness for Jesus in our Judea? Again, I would kind of picture our Judea as being that area beyond two miles from this church, but, but no further than, than 25 miles from this church. And think about the opportunities we have to be a witness there. It's such a blessing to know that once a month, one group from this church goes up to Open Door Ministry in High Point and shares a meal with the homeless. What a beautiful picture of the love of Jesus. I see that when people have gone up to Ward Street Mission as well, too. And I think about other mission opportunities and, and ways to serve and witness in our Judea. 
But you know what else I think about with our Judea, that area 2 to, to 25 miles from here? That's where almost every one of you live. And that's where almost all of you work and enjoy life. And do you realize that is your primary mission field? Think right now in your Judea. All the people there who do not know Jesus Christ. Think about friends. Think about neighbors. Think about relatives. Think about co-workers. Think about classmates. Jesus Christ today is calling you to be a witness to each one of them. To share with them Jesus. To live out what it means to be his follower. To invite them to put their faith in him. And think of all of those people in your Judea who do not have the blessing of being part of a loving Christian family. What a great group of people to reach out and to be a witness to in your Judea. Jesus says to his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And I don't know what, but I just kind of picture at this point, the moment Jesus says the word Samaria, those 11 disciples let out a co collective groan. You know, I've told you before about those Samaritan people who live in Samaria and the Jews. The, the Jews and the Samaritans were like the Hatfields and McCoys of the Bible. And the feud's been going on hundreds of years. You know, the, the Jews, the Samaritans, they share common ancestors. They can get on Ancestry.com. They can trace back to Abraham. But somewhere along the way, the people who live in Samaria called Samaritans they had intermarried with people of other nations. And so the people of Judah had been looking down at them, saying that they were not true Jews, that they were somehow second class. Jesus has even told his disciples a story about a good Samaritan, but I, I don't know how much effect it's had on them. But Jesus says, now you're to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria. And you know, in time, their hearts would soften to that. Because in the book of Acts, we read about a brave man named Philip taking the message of Jesus to Samaritan people. And we would read of others doing the very same thing. But again, what about our Samaria? And what about your Samaria, my Samaria? You could kind of picture it geographically as being more than 25 miles beyond this church and anywhere in the United States. That's one way geographically to look at it. But there's another way I believe we can look at our Samaria. Because look at what Jesus was asking his followers to do. When he said Samaria, what he was doing was telling his followers to reach out to those people who are not just like you. That's an important part of our Samaria. Yesterday I performed a wedding at Highland Methodist Church up in Hickory. That's the church I served before coming here to be with you. And I've told you before, one of the blessings of that church, they had one service, 160, 170 people that would attend. But you'd look out on a Sunday morning and it might be 95% white, but you would see a handful of African American people. I remember two Pakistani brothers who came every Sunday. One woman, Japanese-American, several Native American, several Latino. And it, it was a beautiful picture to see people who were not necessarily all alike, but they were united by their faith in Jesus and their love for Jesus. Folks, that's what it means to be a witness in Samaria. Are we being a witness in Samaria? Are we reaching out to people whose skin color may not be the same as ours? Are we reaching out to people who, who may not have as much as we have? Are the doors of this church open to absolutely everyone? That's what it means to be a, a witness in Samaria. Jesus says to his disciples, he says to them, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. I remember growing up, somebody, or my first appointment, people used to say, Anson County, North Carolina, that's the end of the earth. You know, 
hitting close to home for somebody back there. But, uh, but no, no, it says the ends of the earth in the scripture today. To take the message of Jesus all over the world. And you know, within a decade, the believers were doing that. People like Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and uh, Silas and John Mark, they were taking the message of Jesus to the remotest parts of the known world of their day. They would go and meet people and get acquainted with people. They would share the story about Jesus and his great love. They would invite people to believe in him. They would start churches in all of these locations. And what a blessing it was to see the message of Jesus really going to the ends of the earth. What about us today? And what about our ends of the earth? What's it mean for us to do that? Again, geographically, the ends of the earth might, for these purposes, be anywhere outside of the United States. And I can think of my life only one opportunity I, I've had to share Christ outside of this country. Twenty years ago, I was in Korea for a, a ten-day vacation with some friends I went to school with. And one night, I was invited to preach at a church. And uh, Rebecca, I had one hour's notice for that. And... Uh, if you've gotten the least bit acquainted with me, you know I love to study and prepare. And uh, one hour, I was sweating. But with the help of a translator, I had the opportunity to just share a simple message about the love of Jesus Christ. That's my one and only opportunity, I believe, to be a witness to the ends of the earth. Do you realize that even if we don't leave the country, we can be a witness to the ends of the earth? We can be a witness to the ends of the earth as we pray. As we pray for people all around the world. As we pray for believers and missionaries that God would use them in sharing their faith. As we pray for people all around the world who do not know Jesus Christ. We pray and we work and we witness to the ends of the earth as we show generosity toward those who are serving there. You know, every Sunday morning when we take our offering, a portion of what we give goes to our annual conference, and from that, a portion of that supports missionary efforts all around the world to the ends of the earth. And that's where we are all to be his witnesses, just as Jesus told his disciples. Listen to what he said to them one more time. Listen to what he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus does say a whole lot in those words. But it's also good to listen for what he does not say. For example, he does not say that being a witness to the ends of the earth is more important than being a witness to Jerusalem. And he does not say that being a witness in Samaria and that distant region is more important than being a, a, a witness in Judea where you may live. You know what I hear Jesus saying in all of that? Is that the validity and the value and the impact of your witness is not determined by how many miles away from home you go. No, it's determined by your heart. A heart filled with love for Jesus, a heart filled with love for people, and a heart that longs to see people everywhere come to know this Jesus. That's what a heart of a witness truly looks like. One Sunday morning, a little boy had a brand new Sunday school teacher. And his mother was real curious about that Sunday school teacher. So after Sunday school, after the worship service, after lunch, she sat down with him in the living room and says, Now, now tell me about Sunday school this morning and, and tell me who is your Sunday school teacher. The little boy looked up at mom with a matter of fact look on his face and said, Well, my teacher today was Jesus' grandma. And she busted out laughing just like him. 
She said, come on. He, he, she couldn't be Jesus' grandma. What has you thinking that, that your Sunday school teacher was Jesus' grandma? He spoke up and said, well, all she did was hold up his picture and tell us everything he ever did. <laughs> what an accurate definition of grandmas, right? But also, what an accurate definition of a witness for Jesus. Because what it means to be a witness is to hold up a picture of Jesus by the way you live your life. And then to speak up and tell of all the great things he's done. And I promise you today, filled with the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus, as you step forward to do just that, Jesus will use you. He will use you to make a difference, and he will use you to change the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for all that it means that you've risen from the dead. And help us today to realize, yes, it's great that because you're alive, you've forgiven us and given us a second chance. And, and thank you that because you're alive, we can trust you for everything. But help us to realize right now in this moment that because you are alive, alive in our hearts, that you have something for us to do. And that is to share the great love and mercy and grace and salvation that you have poured into our hearts and lives. And to share it with all of us. Lord, come now in the power of the Holy Spirit and help us to do just that. We ask it all in your name, Jesus. Amen. In a few moments, we're going to sing together. We have a story to tell to the nations. Before we do, though, I want you to think about what Jesus said to his disciples 2,000 years ago and think about what he is saying to us, his followers, his disciples today. He says, first of all, in the power of the Holy Spirit, you're to be his witness. Do you need that? Come forward today as we sing just to kneel and pray and say, Jesus, I want to be your witness. I want to ask you to fill me with your love and the power of your Holy Spirit so I can share who you are with absolutely everyone. Today, this morning, as you're thinking about your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, the ends of the earth, running through your minds may be people you know who don't know Christ. Perhaps people or families who, who don't have a church home. You may want to come and pray for them today. That God would help you to be a witness to them. That God would give you the right opportunity and the right words to speak and encourage them. I invite you to come and to pray about that today. And as always, whatever special needs you may have, you bring those as well. Come and pray as we stand now and as we sing, we have a story to tell to the nations.
Church, we do have a story to tell to the nations. Now go and tell that story by everything you do and everything you say. Amen.